of Goal by Vasco de Lobera, translated by Robert Southey. Book Three, Chapter Eight. How King Lisuarte, going to the chase with the Queen and his daughters, came to the mountain where the hermit Nasciano dwelt, and by what strange adventure he met a fair child who was the son of Amadis and Oriana, and how he took the child, not knowing him. King Lisuarte, to solace himself and his knights, resolved to go hunt in the forest, and take with him the queen and her daughters, and all her damsels, and he bade the tents be pitched by the fountain of the seven beech-trees, which was a pleasant place. Now you are to know that this was the forest where the hermit Nasciano dwelt, and where he was breeding up as Plandian. There, leaving the queen in her fair tent, the king and his huntsmen went into the thickest part of the mountain, where, because that ground was kept, they had plenty of sport. It so fell out that the king started the stag, and followed him down into the valley, and there a strange thing chanced, for he saw a child coming down the opposite hill, a boy of five years old, the prettiest that ever he had seen, leading a lioness in the leash, and when he saw the stag, he loosed her and allude her to the game. Presently the lioness overtook him, and slew him, and began to suck his blood, and the child came running up, and with him another somewhat older than himself, and they took out their knives, and gave the lioness her share. The king stood in the thicket, wondering at what he saw, and his horse was frightened at the lioness, and would not go towards her. Presently the boy took a horn which hung from his neck, and blew it, and two spaniels came up the one tawny, and the other black, and they had their fees of the game. This done, they leashed the lioness again, and went up the hill. By this the king had fastened his horse to a tree, and called out to the boy to stop, and when he came up and saw how beautiful he was, he marvelled more than before, and he said to him, "'God bless thee, my fine boy, and keep thee for his service. Tell me where you are brought up, and whose son you are. Sir, replied the child, the holy man Nasciano, the hermit, breeds me up, and he is my father. The king mused a while how a man so holy and so old should have so young and so fair a child, and did not believe that it could be so. He then asked him where the hermit's house was. The child showed him a path, but little trodden on. You may go up there, but I must follow that boy who's taking the lioness to the fountain where we have our game. So he went his way, and the king went to horse, and followed the path till he came to the hermitage, which was among beech-trees and brambles, and he saw no one there. Then he alighted and went in, and he found an old man kneeling and reading prayers in a book. He was in his habit, and his hair was quite grey. When he had finished his prayers, he looked round and saw the king, and the king knelt before him, and besought his blessing, which the good man gave, and asked him, then, what he would have. "'Good friend,' replied Lisuarte, "'I have met a fair boy in the mountain, hunting with a lioness, who told me that you bred him up, and because he is so beautiful, and this thing so strange, I come to ask you who he is, promising you, on the word of a king, that no harm shall come from the discovery either to him or you. When the good man heard this, he recollected the king's person, and knelt down and kissed his hand. But the king raised him up, and embraced him, saying, Friend Nasciano, I am very desirous to know this. Do not fear to tell me. The good man led him out of the chapel, and they sat down on a bench in the porch, by where his horse was fastened, and he said, Sir, I believe you, that you will protect the child as it has pleased God to protect him. He then told him how he had found the child, and of the letters on his breast. You tell me such wonders, replied Lisuarte, as I never heard till now. It must needs be that the lion has found him near this place. I cannot say, said Nasciano nor let us seek to know more of this than pleases God. Then said the king, 
I beseech you come and eat with me to-morrow at the fountain of the seven beech-trees, where you will find the queen and our company, and bring with you Esplandian and the lioness, and your nephew, to whom I ought to show favour for the sake of Sargil his father, who was a good knight, and served the king my brother well. The king then returned to his pavilion. He reached it two hours after noon, and there he found Don Galor and Norandel and Guillan the Pensive, who had just arrived with two deer, with whom he talked and made merry, but of his own adventure he said nothing. Then bade he the cloths be spread. But Don Grumedan came up, and said, Sir, the queen hath not yet eat, and she requests to speak with you first. For so it behoveth. Immediately he rose and went to her, and she showed him a letter, sealed with an emerald, through which threads of gold were passed, and there were letters round about it, saying, This is the seal of Urganda the Unknown. Sir, quoth she, as I came along the road a damsel met us, richly attired upon a palfrey, and a dwarf with her upon a good horse. She rode by all my company, and close by my daughter, without vouchsafing a word to them, but when I came up she said, Queen, take this letter, and read it with the king before you dine and then she and the dwarf spurred away so fast that there was no time to ask her anything. The king then opened the letter and read thus. To the most high and honoured King Lisuarte, I, Erganda the Unknown, who love you, advise you to your benefit, that at the time when the fair boy who has been nursed by three nurses shall appear, you love him and cherish him well for great joy shall he bring to you, and shall deliver you from the greatest danger wherein ever you were placed. He is of high lineage, and know, O king, that from the milk of his first nurse you shall be so strong and fierce of heart that his great feats in arms shall obscure all the worthies of his own time, and from his second nurse you shall be gentle and courteous and humble and of all good qualities, and from his third nurse prudent and of good understanding and right catholic and of fair speech therefore he will be beloved by all and no knight shall equal him and his great deeds in arms shall all be employed in the service of the most high god despising that which other knights of these days follow more for the honour and vain glory of this world than for the sake of conscience so that he shall have god on his right hand and his lady on his left and I tell thee, moreover, good king, that this child shall make peace between thee and Amadis and his lineage, which shall last all thy days, and which none other could do. When he had read this, the king blessed himself, and said, The wisdom of this woman can neither be imagined nor expressed. I have this day found the child of whom she speaks. And with that he told the queen what had happened, and how Nasciano and the boy would be with them on the morrow. Right joyful was Brisena to think she should see that child, and talk with that holy man about her conscience. The king then bade her say nothing of all this, and he returned to his tent to take food. There he told his knights not to go hunt the next day, for he had a letter to read to them from Arganda the Unknown. And he ordered the huntsman to drive all the beasts into a sheltered valley and keep them there all the day. This did he that they might not be frightened by the lioness. So thus, as you hear, they passed the day regaling themselves in that meadow which was full of flowers and of fresh green grass. On the morrow they all assembled in the king's tent and there heard mass. Lisuarte then took them to the queen's pavilion which was pitched beside a fountain in a fresh meadow, for it was the month of May. The curtains of the pavilion were open, so that the princesses and dames and damsels of high parentage were all seen seated on the estrados, and there the high-born knights went and conversed with them. The king then had the letter of Raganda read, whereat they were all greatly amazed, marvelling what fortunate child it might be, but most of all Oriana mused thereon, and sighed for her son, thinking that perhaps this might be he whom she had lost. "'What think ye of this letter?' said the king. "'Certes, sir,' replied Don Galaor, 
I doubt not that what she saith will come to pass, as it ever hath done, and how much soever others may rejoice when the child shall appear, with reason shall I above all others be glad, seeing that through him shall be accomplished the thing I most desire, which is to see my brother Amadis and his kinsmen in your love and service once more, as they were heretofore wont to be. Lisuarte answered, All this is in the hand of God. He will do his service, and we must be contented. While they were thus communing, they beheld the hermit coming, and his boys with him. Esplandian came first, leading the lioness in a slender leash, and the two spaniels coupled, and behind him was the holy man Nasciano. Then came Esplandian's foster-brother, Sargil, and two bowmen who had taught Esplandian in the mountain, and they brought upon one beast the stags whom Lisuarte had seen the lioness slay, and on another two roebucks and hares and rabbits whom the boys and they had killed with their arrows. When they in the tents beheld such a company, and that great and terrible lioness, they rose hastily and went to place themselves before the king, but he held out a wand and bade them remain in their places, saying that he who led this lioness would defend them. It may be so, replied Don Galaor, but methinks we should have a weak defender in the huntsman who leads her if she should grow angry. This is a marvellous thing to see. The boys and the archers now stopped to let the good man go forward. Friends, said Lisuarte, this is the holy man Nasiano, who dwells in the mountain. Let us go to him, that he may give us his blessing. They then went and knelt before him. And the king said, Servant of God and happy man, give us your blessing. He raised his hand and replied, Receive it in his name as from a sinner. The king then led him to Brisena, but when the women beheld that fierce lioness looking at them and rolling her eyes round, her red tongue lolling out and her teeth showing so sharp and strong, they were greatly affrighted. The queen and her daughter and all well welcomed Nasciano, and they were all amazed at the great beauty of the child, who went to the queen, saying, Lady, we have brought you this game. My good boy, said the king, divide it as you like. And this he said to see what he would do. The boy answered, The game is yours, do you dispose of it? Nay, quoth the king, you shall divide it. The boy was abashed, and there came a colour like a rose into his cheek. Sir, said he, take you the stag for yourselves and your companions. He then went to the queen, who was talking with Nasciano, and kneeling down, kissed her hands and gave her the roebox. Then, looking on his right, he thought that none whom he saw appeared more worthy to be honoured than Oriana, his own mother, whom he did not know, and he gave her the partridges and rabbits, saying, Lady, we have slain no other game than this with our arrows. Fair child, replied Oriana, God speed you in your sport and in all else. The king then called him, and Galaur and Norandel took him in their arms and embraced him as if the force of kin were working in them. Lisuarte commanded silence and said to the good man, Father and friend of God, Say now before all these what you related to me concerning this child. The good man then related how he had met the lioness with this child in her mouth, carrying him home to her whelps, and how by God's mercy she laid the babe at his feet, and how richly he was clothed, and the lioness had suckled him first, and then a ewe-sheep, till he had given him to a nurse, all as the history hath related it. But when Oriana and Mobilia and the damsel of Denmark heard this, they looked at each other, and their flesh trembled with exceeding joy, for they knew of a truth that this child was the son of Amadis, whom the damsel had lost. But when the hermit told of the letters on his breast, and uncovered his breast that all might see, then were they certain that this was he, and the delight of their hearts was so great that it cannot be expressed, and above all that of Oriana, to behold the child whom she had lost. Then Lisuarte asked the boys of Nasciano that he might have them brought up, to the which the good man assented, 
seeing that God had made them more for such a life than for the one he could give them. Yet was it with great grief of heart that he consented, and knowing the loneliness he should feel in losing them, for he loved Esplandian dearly. When the king had them thus at his disposal, he gave Esplandian to the queen to serve her, and she soon gave him to her daughter Oriana, greatly rejoiced thereat, as she who had brought him forth. Thus was that child placed under his mother's care, he who had been in the lioness's mouth. These are the wonders of the Most High God, the preserver of his all. Other sons of princes are lapped in silks, and nursed with all blandishments and delicacies, and so carefully that they who tend them must neither sleep nor rest, and yet with little hurt and slight ailing they are taken out of the world. For so God wills, and fathers and mothers must receive his allotments as what is just, and thank him for doing his own will, which cannot err like ours. The queen then confessed to that holy man. Oriana did the same, and told him the secret of her love, and how that child was hers, and by what adventure she had lost him, a thing which till then she had never communicated, and she besought him to remember it in his prayers. Much did the good man marvel to hear of such love in one of so high degree, who was above all others bound to give a good example and he reproved her sharply, bidding her give over so great an error, else he would not absolve her, and her soul would be in great peril. But she, weeping, told him how when Amadis released her from Archelaus, she had received his pledged word as husband, as it ought to be. Then was the hermit full glad, and he was the means whereby many were delivered from cruel death that awaited them, as shall be seen hereafter. Then he absolved her, and appointed such penance as was convenient. He then took Esplandian to the king, and embraced the boy, and wept, saying, Child of God, whom he gave me to bring up, may he guard and protect thee, and make thee a good man for his holy service. Then he kissed him, and gave him his blessing, and delivered him to the king, and taking his leave, he returned with the archers and the lioness to his hermitage. CHAPTER Nine, How the Knight of the Green Sword, after he had left King Tafanar of Bohemia, to go to the islands of Romania, met a great company with the Lady Grasinda, and how one of her knights called Brandasidel would have made him come before her by force. You have heard how the Green Sword Knight resolved to go through the islands of Romania. There he went, redressing the oppressed and quelling the proud and passing through great perils combating knights and giants, and suffering wounds and sickness at times, gaining great renown, yet neither danger nor toil abating the mortal grief which he endured for Oriana's sake. Thus, as he wandered, having no rest either of body or mind, he came to a seaport called Sadiana, opposite Greece. The city was fairly situate at the extremity of the land, with gardens and high towers. Now, because the day was yet before him, he did not enter the city, but went about beholding it, for it was a goodly place, and he delighted to look at the sea, which he had not seen since he left Gaul, now more than two years agone. Presently he saw a great company of knights and dames and damsels going along shore towards the town. Among them was a lady most richly garmented, over whom they carried a rich cloth upon four rods to defend her from the sun. The knight of the green sword, who took little pleasure in beholding company, but rather in going alone, and thinking upon his lady, turned aside that he might not meet them. Presently there came a knight towards him, upon a strong horse, well armed and shaking a lance as if he would have broken it. He was strong of body and large-limbed, and a good horseman, and with him came a damsel of that company in rich attire. When he of the green sword saw that they made towards him, he stopped. The damsel came up and said, Sir, the lady my mistress commands you to come before her at her pleasure, and this she tells you for your profit. He, though the damsel spake German, understood her well, for it was always his custom to learn the language of the countries which he passed through. Damsel, he replied, May God grant honour to your lady and you. 
but tell me what yonder knight would have. That matters not, she answered. Do what I tell you. That shall I not till your reply. I must then answer against my will. When my lady saw you and the dwarf with you, she thought you might be the strange knight who has gone through this country, doing such wonders in arms as had never till now been witnessed. She therefore wished to honour you, and to disclose to you a secret which hath hitherto been known to none. When yonder knight understood her pleasure, he said he would make you come to her command, whether you would or no, which he can well do, being the mightiest man in arms of all this land. I therefore counsel you to leave him alone and come with me. Damsel, quoth he, I am ashamed not to obey the command of your lady, but I choose that you should see whether he can do as he hath said. She replied, I am sorry at this, for your courtesy hath much pleased me. Then she departed, and he of the green sword rode on as before. With that the other knight cried out in a loud voice, You, sir, good for nothing who will not go with the damsel, alight directly, and with your shield reversed, get up the wrong way upon your horse, and take the tail for a bridle, and present yourself in that manner before yonder lady, unless you choose to lose your head. Take your choice. Certes, knight, replied he, it is not my intention to choose either of these things. I rather choose you should have the one. Quoth he, I shall make thee. And with that he spurred his horse, thinking at the first encounter to bear him from the saddle, as he had done many others, for he was the best jouster far or near. The knight of the dwarf had taken his arms, and now went towards him, being well covered with his shield. That joust was decided at the first meeting, for the lances break, and the threatening knight was borne to the ground. He of the green sword had his shield and mail pierced, and the lance iron wounded his throat, so that he felt he should suffer much therefrom. He turned upon Brandasidel, for so was that knight called, and seeing that he lay like one dead, bade Gandalin take off his helmet and see if he was slain. He did accordingly, and then the knight breathed and attempted to recover, but he could not. But then that other placed the point of the green sword at his face. You, sir knight, who threaten and despise those whom you do not know, shall now either lose your head or pass through your own law. He recovered his senses better with the fear of death, and hung down his head. Will you not speak? I shall off with thy head. Then he cried, Ah, knight, mercy! I will rather obey you than die in such a state as to lose my soul. Be it done, then, forthwith. Brenda Zidel then called his squires, and they placed him backward upon his horse, and reversed his shield round his neck, and put the tail in his hand for a bridle, and in this plight they led him before that fair lady, and through the town that all might see him and that he might be an example to those who insult and despise those whom they do not know. Greatly did that lady and her company and all the townsmen marvel at his overthrow, and the more, therefore, they praised his conqueror, believing now the wonders which they had heard spoken of him. This being done, the green sword knight went to the damsel who had witnessed all, and said, Now, lady damsel, if it pleases you, I will obey your mistress. It does please me quoth she, and so will it please my lady Kerzinda. So they went together, and when he beheld that lady, he thought that since he had left his sister Melissia, he had seen none so fair, and she thought him the comeliest knight that ever she had beheld. Sir, quoth she, I have heard of your great prowess, for by your dwarf and your green sword I perceive that you are he who served King Tafanar of Bohemia so well and who have since achieved such wonders in arms. Now I see you are wounded, and beseech you to be my guest here in this very town that you may be healed. You will not in all this province be so well lodged elsewhere. Lady, quoth he, seeing your good will, I would obey you in a thing of toil and danger, how much more in this which is to me so necessary. He then went toward the town. An old knight who led her bridle gave it to him of the green sword to lead, and he rode forward to prepare the stranger's lodging, for he was that lady's steward. 
when they entered the gates the doors and windows were all filled with people all crowding to see this lady who was greatly beloved and this knight of whom they had heard so much they thought him the handsomest and best maid whom they had ever seen and deemed that he had performed never greater exploit than in discomforting branda sedel so much had he been feared thus they arrived at the palace and there was he lodged in a rich chamber such as became the dwelling of such a lady and was disarmed and his hands and face washed from the dust and they gave him a rose-coloured mantle when grasinda saw him thus attired she thought him more beautiful than she had believed mortal man could be and she sent for a master to heal his wounds the best and skilfullest in all those parts he looked at the wound in his throat and said knight you are hurt in a dangerous part and you must rest otherwise you will be in great pain and danger the knight answered master i beseech you by the faith you owe to god and to this your lady that as soon as i am in a state to ride you let me know it for it doth not befit me to rest or be at ease till it shall please god to bring me there where my heart desires to be and when he said this he could not restrain his tears whereat he was ashamed and wiped them hastily away and made semblance of mirth the master then dressed his wound and gave him food such as was fitting then said grasinda rest now sir and sleep and we will go to our meal we will see you when it is time and do you bid your squire ask freely for whatever is wanted with that they left him and he remained thinking of oriana for in that thought was all his pleasure and delight though mingled with such pain but when grasinda had eaten and retired to her chamber and was in her bed she thought upon the beauty of the green sword knight and of the great feats which he had performed in arms and though she was of such high degree being niece to king tafener of bohemia and widow of a great knight with whom she had lived only one year having no issue and though she believed him to be only an errant knight she resolved to have him for her husband but while she was devising how this might be brought about she recollected how she had seen him weep and thought that that could only have been because of some woman whom he loved and could not obtain this made her pause and resolved to learn more concerning him so hearing he was awake she went with her ladies to visit him as well to show him honour as for the great pleasure she took in beholding him and talking with him nor had he less though for a very different cause thus she continued to be in his company devising for him every pleasure that could be till one day being unable to endure this longer she took gandalin aside and said good squire whom god bless and make happy tell me one thing if you know it and i promise you it shall never be by me discovered do you know any woman whom your master dearly and affectionately loves lady replied gandalin i and this dwarf have lived with him but a short time serving him for the great renown which we had heard of his great feats and he told us never to inquire his name nor anything concerning him unless we chose directly to be dismissed but since we have been with him we have seen enough to be assured that he is the best knight in the world i know nothing more the dame then hung down her head and mused greatly gandalin beheld her and suspecting that she loved his master wished to relieve her from a wish which never could be gratified and he said to her lady i often see him weep and that so bitterly that it can only be for extreme love for that is an evil which neither strength nor courage can overcome as god shall save me she replied i believe you and thank you for what you have told me go to him now and god help him in his wishes she then went to her woman resolving no longer to encourage those thoughts for seeing how steadfast he was in his words and actions she believed he was not one who would be changed thus as you hear was he of the green sword attended in the house of that great lady the fair and rich grasinda as though she had known him instead of a poor errant knight as he seemed to be son of a great king as in truth he was now when he felt himself able to bear arms he ordered gandalin to prepare for their departure and he answered that all was ready 
but while they were speaking, Grasinda with four damsels entered the apartment. He rose and led her to an estrado, which was covered with a cloth of silk and gold, and said to her, My lady, I am now in a state to travel. If any service of mine can afford you pleasure, willingly will I put it in action, for the great honour which I have received at your hands. Certus, Sir Knight of the Green Sword, I believe what you say, and when I ask a return for the pleasure and service you have received here, if any it have been, then will I, without hesitation or shame, disclose to you that which hath hitherto been known to none. Meantime, tell me, I pray you, whither would you design to go? Toward Greece, if it please God, to see the manner of life among the Greeks and their emperor, of whom I have heard good things. Then I must help you in your voyage. I will give you a ship manned with good mariners to be at your command, and victualled for a year, and I will give you Master Helisabad, who cured your wounds, for such another in his art cannot be found far or near, on condition that if you be at your own disposal you will be in this town with me within a year. The knight was right glad of this good offer. My lady, quoth he, if I cannot serve you for all these favours, I shall hold myself the unhappiest knight in the world. And so in like manner, if I should know that you hesitate or shame to ask what you desire. Sir, she replied, when God shall bring you back from this voyage, I will demand that which my heart hath long desired, and which will be to the advancement of your honour, albeit with some peril. Be it so, and I trust in your wisdom that you will ask nothing which you may not rightfully perform. Do you then rest five days, said she, while everything is prepared? At the end of that time the ship was ready, and the knight embarked with Master Helisabad, in whom next to God he trusted for his safety. So they set sail, not straight to Constantinople, but to those islands of Romania which he had not visited, and to the islands of Greece, and there for a long time did that knight prove himself in abating the insolence of the haughty, and against many knights who came to try themselves against him, but he still won the victory and the praise from all, and Master Helisabad always healed his wounds. But at length the mariners were wary of sailing thus from one island to another, and complained to Master Helisabad of their great fatigue, and he repeated it to the knight, who bade them then steer directly for Constantinople, for by the time he had been to that city and could sail from it, the year would be expired. We told you in the second book how El Patin went to prove himself against the knights of Great Britain, and how, reckless of his former love to Queen Sardamira of Sardinia, he asked Oriana of her father in marriage, and how, falling in with Amadis, he was by him sorely wounded in the head. That wound brought him oftentimes to the point of death, so that he returned forthwith to Rome, where he was soon chosen emperor by reason of his brother's death. But then, thinking that he might more easily obtain Oriana, of whose love he nothing doubted, he determined again to ask her of King Lisuarte, and for this purpose to dispatch his cousin, Solistanquidio, prince of Calabria, a famous knight in arms, and with him Broncadel of the Rock, his high steward, and the archbishop of Talancia, and a company of three hundred men, and the fair queen Sardamira, with dames and damsels in her train, to bring home Oriana. So they prepared to fulfil the emperor's pleasure, as you shall hear hereafter. End of Book 3, Chapter 9